All right, church, let's dive into our Bible time today. And as I said at the beginning, this is a beautiful passage because it's one of these passages where if you just skim over it, you're going to come away with probably one conclusion and it's not going to be totally accurate. But if you if you soak in it and if you open it up and think about the words and what it's saying, it's just rich and you're going to see the depth of this passage and the, uh, the powerful application of this passage for our lives. And uh, just to bring us back to the point of the application here, we need to remember that we are in a letter that has told us we are chosen, that we are exiles, that we're not in a land that is ours, but we are from a different place and we are um, to represent that place here. We've, we've talked about being the recipient of the greatest inheritance in the universe. We've talked about uh, being made like Jesus who gave himself to redeem us. And, and, and now we're talking about what does that look like? What does that look like in the context of our lives? What does that look like under the Roman government? What does that look like under uh, you know cruel masters if we were slaves? And now we're going to, to ask the question, what does that look like in our household? What does it look like to live as children of God in our household, in our relationships, and all the complexities that come with that? And so, um, again, this is, this is a passage you need to come to to think about and not just to skim over because, uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen and heard of stories where people take the husband and wife passages and they almost use it like a, you know, a weapon to say like, you know, husbands say, you better obey me because look what the Bible says or, or you know, men are more important than women or whatever, you know, whatever it goes to. That's, that's actually totally backwards from what we're going to see today. Now, before we get there, I want you to think on um, the biblical purpose of marriage because uh, looking way back, uh, right, you know, right from the beginning, marriage was given to Adam and Eve in the garden and they were given in marriage. Adam was to leave his, you know, kind of his life and, and join himself to another person. And, and that's like the, the foundation of marriage. And it was Adam, a man and wife, Eve, and they had certain roles and they were partners. And um, I want you to listen to uh, this passage, which is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. He's talking about marriage, about man leaving his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two will become one flesh. That's verse 31. And he says, this mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And that's amazing because what do you hear when you hear that? He's talking about marriage and a man leaving and, and holding fast to his wife and them coming together. And he says, it's a mystery. And I'm talking about Christ and his church. And what we get from that, which is very important when we're, if we're ever going to talk about Christian marriage, is that marriage is actually a picture. You see, you can use pictures in different ways. You could use you know, a picture we understand to try and give an example of something. Um, and, you know, we could say, we could look at the book of Revelation and say, well, it talks about, you know, Christ and his bride being joined. So we're using marriage to explain what Jesus is doing. But what Paul is saying is actually it's backwards. Marriage is explaining what Jesus is doing. Mar Christ and his church are the picture and marriage is reflecting that. Christ and his church are the reality and the marriage is, is just reflecting that reality. And so uh, that's the foundation, right? From the, be from the very beginning, Men and women were placed on the earth as image bearers of God. You've heard that before if you've been around church. But what that means is like a statue placed, we're like living statues placed to represent God. And uh, what we see here is that marriage is a part of that. Now, not that everyone has to be married. Uh, that's a different topic for a different day. But marriage is a part of shining forth who God is. And uh, it's an important part because it shows the story of the gospel. Marriage is like a play playing out the story of the gospel, a recital of the purpose of history, the Lord uniting with his people. Now, unfortunately, marriage doesn't always play out like that. And we're going to talk about that, but it's just like we talked about last week. There, there's good and, you know, there's right relationships we can have, but people don't always play their part. And 
you know, we see things like injustice. We see abuse. We see a misrepresentation of Jesus. We see neglect. We see people uh, breaking their marriages apart. We see people using their authority wrongly. And these things plague marriages, Christian marriages and non-Christian marriages. So we have passages in the Bible, like the one we're going to read today, that help reorient us to tell us what a, a home or, or should look like, what a marriage should look like in Christ. And it's, it's beautiful that we have things to show us what to do in all kinds of situations. So with all of that said, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. That's where we're going to be today, continuing from last week. 1 Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to read first verse 1 to 6. In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that even if some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live when they observe your pure, reverent lives. Don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For in the past, the holy women who put their hope in God also adorned themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do what is good and do not fear any intimidation. So let's take a look at this passage. Now, first I want you to notice that the very first thing he says here is in the same way, or your Bible might say likewise. That means we're referring back to something. We're referring back to this idea of submission. We're referring back to this idea of in, uh, injustice and suffering and enduring injustice. And we're especially referring back to the idea that Jesus is our example of suffering and he went before us to show us how to walk in his steps. Remember last week, just like Jesus. We're called to be just like Jesus. And so Peter says, you too, wives, in the same way, submit to your husband. You know, Peter knows what's up, okay? And, and history tells us, when we look back, uh, it, that the church had a had a huge influx of women. You know that of women. That's not just you know modern times. Some people say, well, now the church is made up of so many women. That in the beginning there was uh, of the church there was lots of women coming and being a part, and, and very often their husbands did not join, at least not right away. And so you have all these women who were abandoning the faith of their family, a bit, whether it was. Judaism, whether it was the Greek religion, they were abandoning their, abandoning their husband's religion, which back then was a big no-no, okay? The husband was the one who dictated the religion of the household. If the husband, you know, if the husband made a decision, everyone followed. But now, women were giving themselves to Jesus even though their husbands didn't agree. And that, that was a difficult place to be. And, and culturally, it was a, a shameful place to be. And uh, you know, it's a recipe for disaster. And so just like Peter talked about the Roman government, you know, being corrupt or, or the cruel masters over their slaves, um, he says to the wives, submit to your own husbands. Submit to your own husband. Wives in Christ have a role in marriage, he tells them. You, you have a pattern to follow, and it's one of submission. Now, women, don't toss Peter out the window just yet because it, this, is, this passage is very profound and very helpful because he says there's a purpose in your submission. You're not just submitting. It's not just say, go submit to your husband and, you know, just lay down and don't make any suggestions or do nothing. There's a purpose. There's an agenda behind the submission. We could say there's, there's a mission in the submission. He says, if you read it, he says, so that, submit, so that, even if some disobey the word, that is, even when they're not obeying God, even when your husband is not living as he should, even when your husband is not being who God is calling them to be, you can win them without a word. There's two key things there about your mission as women, as wives. First, he's calling you, like I said, to the same thing he's been calling you to the whole time. It's your identity in Christ. Even when someone else isn't living up to that standard. So it's, it's you living up to the standard of Christ. It's you living out your identity in Christ. Even when other people are doing things that aren't fair. Even when people aren't playing their role properly. And we know that if the husband's not in Christ, 
then he's not spiritually leading his family and they're not doing it. So whether that you know whether they're just a nice guy or whether they're a terrible husband, there's this there's this calling to women to say, you are a child of God and you can live that way even if other people aren't. Even if other people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Just because someone else isn't playing their part doesn't mean we don't play our part. Just doesn't mean we forget our mission. It doesn't mean we forget who we are. However, there's another key thing that's big here. Your mission, listen, your mission is not to convince your husband into the kingdom. Now, ladies, this, this can be a huge relief. I know. I've, I've heard this. I've seen it. If you didn't know, Peter was married. Peter had a wife. So, so he knows some of these details he's talking about and you know he's about to drop some pretty awesome things on us and maybe it's just the holy spirit at work in him bringing some you know really clear truth but here's what he's saying the bible is telling you wives that it's okay to struggle with talking to your husband about the gospel it's okay you can take that weight off your soul, shoulders. He's saying here, you can win them without a word. And, and what that's saying, it's not saying you don't ever talk to your husband about Jesus. That's not what it's saying. But what he's saying is your primary means of winning your husband is not trying to convince him by telling him things or by asking him or by nagging him or by pressuring him or by saying, hey, look at this guy. He does this. He believes in God. That's not your primary means of winning your husband over. Your primary means is something different. Okay, your mission which is to reach your husband and win him over with the gospel. That's what it says. This is why you're living in submission. This is why you're living out your identity in Christ in the context of your marriage. And he says it's not so that you can convince them with your words, but you win them without a word by the conduct of your lives. And that's good news because as I'm sure you've experienced, wives, husbands, especially non-believing husbands, aren't really the best at hearing what you have to say about this whole Jesus thing. So the pressure's off. It's not about you trying to convince your husband with your words into the kingdom. Peter says you can win them with your submission, but with your conduct of your life. Let's look at verse 2. What he says here is, they will observe your pure and reverent lives. What is going to win your husband? What is your primary means of trying to win your husband into the kingdom? It's your lives of purity. It's your lives of reverence. And he, he, what he's basically saying is you got to get your priorities straight, okay? You got to get, you know, your, your life being about Jesus. You got to get, you know, your purity and your reverence, your, your life before God at the forefront. And, and he actually gives us a, um, a detailed explanation of this in the next few verses. And he's saying that's going to have a bigger effect on your husband than you trying to convince him with your words. So let's look at a few of the things that he says in the next few verses, starting in verse 3. First, he says, don't let your beauty consist of outward things. Now, this is a very interesting sentence. Yours might say, don't adorn yourself or uh, don't put on and, and etc. What it literally says, if you read it in the original language, is it says, don't let your cosmos be putting on these outward things. And cosmos, if you know any Greek at all, is, is the world. Generally, that's how it's translated or uh, how things are ordered. That's that word. And so what he's saying is don't let your life be just focused around the outward. Okay, it's not saying, I've heard this used, and I, I know there are groups that use this to say, well, we can't you know, wear nice things, we can't do our hair nice, and etc. because that's what Peter says. That's not what he's getting at. What he's getting at is you can't let your life be ordered around this, outward things. You can't let your life be around you know, trying to look great. It's, about, it's not about looking great. It's about being great in Christ, inside. And that's where he goes next. He says, instead, instead of ordering your life around the outward things, instead of trying to make your life about, you know, impressing on the outside or pleasing on the outside, he says, let it consist of or order it around what is inside. Let your life be, let your, let your world be focused around what's happening inside. The hidden person, literally, is what it says. The inside person. You have an inside person. You have a true self in Christ. If you've been born again in Christ, you have a true self. And he says that that true self is, is imperishable beauty. That true self is the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Okay? It, and listen, that doesn't mean like, hey, you got to submit and because inside you're really gentle and quiet and you're like this flaky 
doormat who does everything every that, that's that's not it what it's saying is inside your inner person is the reflection of those aspects of christ like like humility and gentleness and peacefulness and and the steadfastness and grace that it takes to endure that is what he's saying he says that's of great worth to god so listen wives regardless of what your marriage looks like regardless of anything in christ you have imperishable beauty and you have a spirit that is of great value that is precious to god and he's saying let that be what your stuff's ordered around not about the outside forget forget about focusing on the outside not that it's bad that's fine do your thing but but not focusing on the outside but focusing on the inside and then he said he refers back and he says you have this whole hopeful heritage of holy women who lived with this beauty with this grace with this dignity with this strength and they lived in respect of their husbands who were faithful to god so he talks about sarah who who again and again had to endure difficulty as she followed her husband who was following god but she did it with strength she did it with dignity and she he's saying again the theme of injustice and suffering honorably he says that's your heritage and you can live that way he says if you live with faithfulness and fearlessness that's who you are inside faithfulness and fearlessness he says you're doing what is good you know you're enduring but you're doing what is good and then he says you are you are fearless you're, you're not fearing anything that's frightening anything that's intimidating you're enduring in trust of god just like we talked about last week and that is where you follow in the footsteps of the gracious and dignified women of old living with respect and living with submission and strength okay so so this this again is not saying if you if you understand this if you're tracking with me and I hope you are this is not saying you know women lay down and forget doing anything you got to be quiet and not say anything it's actually very much the opposite is saying respect live in respect and submission because you have strength and you have grace and you have gentleness and you have peace that is not of this world and you can endure because you are children you are daughters of the king that's what he's saying and so submission in marriage is reflecting the story of jesus and his church as the church is made beautiful and pure and submitting to christ and so as as a, a woman he says to summarize as a wife who is that in the context of a marriage that's not you know the husband is not part of this he doesn't want anything to do with jesus she, peter's saying your mission is to draw them in by how you live not with convincing negative nagging pandering or or trying to get your husband's approval so maybe he'll none of that but with strength gentleness faithfulness and fearlessness drawing your husband in to the kingdom now already i hope you can see that this is a far cry from you know listen to your husband no matter what it's not that kind of passage god is showing that women submit from a place of power and from a place of purpose and not from a place of weakness and and now peter's going to address the men in in a one verse but if you believe it or not he's he's actually about to call men into something high and he's about to elevate women hugely in the eyes of their husbands and so men i want you to listen closely and i'll repeat we do ourselves a disservice when we just fly through these verses and don't really soak in what they say. So I want you to look at this with me. Let's look at chapter 3 verse 7. He calls to us now and says, "Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker partner, showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered." So now as he's addressing husbands I want you to see he says it again in the same way likewise and that is important because again that's bringing us back to the idea of submission the idea of sacrifice the idea of suffering and justice the idea of Jesus giving himself up for others these are in our minds and he's saying in the same way husbands live with your wives in an understanding way And again, let's bring ourselves back. What is marriage? Marriage is a picture of Jesus and his church. 
Jesus who lowered himself to rescue his church. Jesus who gave of himself to serve his church. And so just like Jesus, just like lowering yourself for the sake of others, just like suffering, he says, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Literally, according to understanding or, or according to knowledge. Which, what that means is, husbands, live with your wives according to what is true according to what God says, according to what the biblical reality is. And he's about to tell us two realities, two bits of knowledge that husbands need to live with. Listen, if you're a husband and you believe in Jesus, you need to have these things in your mind if you want to represent Jesus well in your marriage. And God help us, because we are about to see a very high calling on husbands. Honestly, I've spent some time in these husband and wife passages. I've preached them before. And and even though when you skim through them, it sometimes seems like, well, oh man, wives have it hard and husbands have it easy. They get to lead. They get to tell people what to do. When you actually study them, the calling on husbands is like a heavy responsibility. It's, it's a big deal. And uh, we need to spend more time thinking about this. This is a calling that requires love, requires attention, requires thoughtfulness, humility, sacrifice, all of these things that men uh, are sometimes we're not very good at showing. Anyway, the first thing he says is live, to, if you want to live with your wife according to knowledge, according to understanding, then you need to live with them as with a weaker partner. And, and I know <laughs> that can rub people the wrong way. Is Peter saying, well, you know, women are fragile, so you need to be gentle. You need to be careful that you don't hurt them. I've heard it used this way many times. And so let's dig a bit. Now, it helps to know what a literal translation is here because uh, sometimes in trying to make it you know, more understandable, we lose the literal translation. And also it's helpful to know some of these words, how they're used in the Bible. So we're about to get a little academic here. But, but in the Greek language, this is literally saying, husbands, live with your wives as with a weaker feminine vessel. Vessel is the word in there. And that's kind of a strange word for us to use. But if you look through the New Testament and you picked out that word, you find out that this word often is used to say, to speak about our bodies, our physical bodies. So for example, if you know the famous verse where Paul says we carry the gospel in jars of clay, or, or depending on your translation, that, that is literally to say vessels of earth, earthen vessels. He's a, what he's implying there when Paul says that is that our bodies are a fragile tool used for God. We have treasure, we have the gospel, but we're just earthen vessels. We're fragile tools. We're fragile vessels that can break. So Peter here, when he says, live with your wife as a weaker vessel, what he's saying, he's talking about physicality. Okay, he's talking about a weak, weaker physicality. And it's helpful when we think about that to remember that Jesus, when Jesus was with Peter, he very often used physical pictures to help them understand spiritual truths. And we saw that with the fish. We saw that other times. And we've even seen Peter use that strategy already in this book. And so here we have just that, a, a physical picture to, to explain a spiritual truth. Okay, and, and here's what I think it means. Peter's using the physical reality of masculine versus feminine bodies to tell something about the husband's role in marriage. And I know right now in our society, you know, this idea of comparing men and women and their different physicalities and how they are, you know, physically different, objectively different, that's not very popular right now. But the... the the fact is, generally speaking, I know this isn't you know every single case in the world. Generally speaking, men grow to be bigger and stronger than women. Okay, if you had, you know, you know, if you took your average husband and wife, the man is bigger and stronger. I know that you know there are some intense women who are strong and intense, and that's awesome. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, a man is bigger and stronger than his wife. And so, when we look at this. We're missing the point if we say, well, you know, women don't have to be weaker than men. That, that's, not, that's not the point at all. What, the general truth is being used here to speak of this, 
this general idea that you know if a man is generally bigger and stronger his physicality you know we have more muscle mass percentage generally there's this responsibility that has come with that historically okay men have, you know women and children off the boat first men have had this responsibility to take the harder road men have had the responsibility to protect to stand in the gap when there needs to be protection to offer strength to provide to serve okay this is this is what it often has meant to be a man. Generally speaking, when, when men look at themselves and say, well, I'm bigger and stronger, okay, I'm gonna do the heavy lifting. I'm gonna sacrifice more because I have more to give. And so when we're talking about a husband loving and serving his wife like Christ does the church, he needs to live with her in a way that he is ready and willing to lay himself down, to lay his needs down, to fight for his wife and protect her. And honestly, Knowing Peter, you know, we've seen him in the Gospels. We've seen he's kind of outspoken. We've seen he's going to say first, think later. And I almost think he's saying a little bit tongue-in-cheek even here. Like, he's saying, you know, okay, you think you're strong. You think you're big and strong. Well, well, bring that to your marriage because your job is to lay yourself down and serve. And, you know, I had a, a one good mentor when I was, uh, just before we got married, one of the things that stuck out to me that he said is, you want to know something that you got to remember your whole marriage? It's your job to eat the humble pie. What he was saying is, Josh, as a husband, it's your job to lay yourself down first. It's your job to put yourself down, your needs down, and elevate your wife's needs. And that's been good advice, honestly. And when Peter says this, when he talks about, you know, the man being the, the stronger vessel in a sense, he, it, it's... It's nothing to do with, you know, women, you better listen to men because, you know, that's what the Bible says. And that's not, that's foolishness. The, the Bible really doesn't say almost anything like that. Like, think about how the Bible describes leadership. Think about how the Bible describes greatness. It's always serving. It's always lowering yourself. So to take a passage like this and say, see, you have to listen to me. That's missing the point of biblical greatness and biblical leadership. It's being a servant. It's laying yourselves down. So that's what Peter's calling them to first. Husbands, pursue your wife. Husbands, lead your wife. Husbands, fight for her. Work to serve her. Work to fulfill her needs just like Jesus does with his bride. So listen, when husbands are rough and intimidating and condescending and violent, and abusive and mean that's messing it up that's not what marriage is supposed to look like Peter says understanding what marriage is the, the understanding we need it is that we are to be the opposite gentle sacrificial laying ourselves down just like Jesus that's the first piece of knowledge now he gives a second piece of knowledge to guide husbands how to think about marriage and their role in it and he says Honor your wives as co-heirs of the grace of life. So not only are you supposed to take your macho manliness and, and lay yourself down to serve her, take the hard road, fight for her, but he says, respect her as standing in the same spot as you. When it comes to your place before God, when it comes to rank and reverence, she's a co-heir. Think about it. When you read, you know, when a man comes in and reads, live with your wife as a weaker vessel, you could come away from that and say, well, I can look down on her in a sense, right? I can kind of condescend because I'm the stronger and she's the weaker. And now he says, you've got it backwards. Look up to her. Look up to her. Honor her. Okay. And this is awesome for smashing the expectations of the time we say this you know some people say well the bible's outdated <laughs> this is smashing all expectations like in the wider culture women were like you do what the man says you follow the man's religion you know he's the one who has rank he's the one we revere and now peter is saying honor your wives as heirs with you and uh, and the, it was true too that back then Men were typically heirs. Now, women, you know, sometimes got things, but the main heirs of an estate were men. And so here, Peter's saying, with God, all children are on the same level. Sons and daughters, you are both heirs. You are co-heirs alongside Jesus. So there's this awesome balance of, you know, if men are trying to get 
you know, getting in these fantasies of I'm so strong and I'm so great. He, he's saying you need to lay yourself down and you need to recognize that your wife is spiritual royalty. She is the nobility of heaven. She is worthy of honor and respect. Listen, he's saying, guys, live in awe of your wives. Okay, they are nobility of heaven. And just like he said, the, they, are, they are beautiful, imperishable beauty. They are of great value to God. And so listen, Christian husbands, if, if you're bored with your wife, if you're thinking, well, imagine you know, if, if there was someone else, if it was different, that is totally not according to knowledge. That's what Peter's saying. According to knowledge means you see your wife as an heir of the grace of of life and if you're not if you're bored of her that's an issue with you that's an issue with us not with our wives we need to get back in reality and see that our our wives are daughters of the king so i hope it's evident from this passage that marriage is a very high calling for both people involved and, and honestly this if you're not married that doesn't mean well forget this sermon i don't need to think about this like there is a dynamic in relationships and there is uh, everyone, literally everyone has some connection to marriage, right? You have parents, you have siblings. And so perhaps in your life at this point in this season or for the rest of your life, you're not going to be married. This is still relevant because this is how the, the picture of, of Jesus and his church plays out in a family. And, and we can all do our part to encourage that, to help others. To, to call them into that. And, and we see that Christian couples are called to this high calling of mutual submission. Listen, it's not, it's not one party only submitting to the other. Peter's made that very clear. And the other thing he's made very clear is it's not, well, if they do their part, I'll do my part. You know, if, if my husband is nicer to me, then I'll submit to him. Or if my wife stops nagging me and listens to me, then I'll start giving her the love she needs. That's that's missing the point. We don't stop our calling when someone else doesn't fulfill their role. And that I think, Peter doesn't explicitly say it, but, but I think that's especially true for husbands. We sometimes have a harder time playing our role, but we have the role of Jesus sacrificing himself for the church. It's nonsense to say, well, she doesn't fulfill my needs. She doesn't listen to me, so I'm not going to you know, give her what she needs. That's not like Jesus at all. Now he says one last thing, and, and this is where we'll close. He says, if we don't live according to reality, so uh, I, I think this could apply to the husbands and the wives, but it does seem like it's saying it more to the husbands. But if we don't live at, in this submission, in this um, living in the knowledge of uh, what the Bible says about marriage, he says, there's consequences. There are consequences. If you don't function the right way, he says your prayers are hindered. Now, does that mean, well, if you don't do your job, God's not going to listen to your prayers. God's going to stop listening to you. He won't answer you if you're not being nice to your wife. I don't think that's quite it. Let's phrase it a different way. Think about this. What happens to your prayer life, individually and as a couple, when there's disunity? What happens when Jesus isn't really a part of your marriage? What happens when pride takes over or disagreement or selfishness or condescension? What happens when that's the atmosphere of your life? What do you think your prayer life is going to be like? What do you think your prayer life with your wife or husband is going to be like? In fact, we could ask the question, what is it like right now? What is your prayer life like? What Peter's saying is that when your marriage is not a thing of mutual submission, when you aren't living in the way of Jesus, your spiritual power is going to be zapped. Not because God's punishing you, but because your kingdom focus is suffering. You're focusing on something else. You're focusing on yourself. Your spiritual intimacy with your spouse suffers and with God suffers. And so it's like this blocker to your prayers. Again, not because God's not listening to you, but because you're hindering yourself in your ability to pray sincerely, to pray consistently, to pray with depth. And we don't want that. And so here's the big idea to sum it up. As the children of God, as heirs of heaven, as followers of the example of Jesus, our marriages, 
our households, our relationships should be marked by mutual submission, by each of us laying ourselves down for the sake of others with respect and with love if we're living according to knowledge. So would you join me? I mean, would you join me in taking up a plan to act on this message? Because marriage messages really easily become, or marriage books really easily become like, oh, that's a great theory. But marriages aren't built on theories. Marriage, marriages are built on lives. That's why when Peter goes through this passage multiple times, he says, live in this way. Wives, live in this way. Husbands will be brought over by the, your conduct, by your lies. He says, husbands, live with your wives in this way. It's not think in a certain way, although that certainly affects your actions. It's live in a certain way. So would you join me now in praying? And would you take seriously the commitment to live in a way of submission that ref reflects this relationship of Jesus and his church? Let's pray right now and ask God to do this in us. Father, your word is so rich. And there's a seriously high calling here. And I know some of us think, how could we ever do that? How could my marriage ever look like that? God, I simply pray now that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would transform the marriages of Lake Windermere Alliance Church. And even for those who aren't married, who are looking forward to marriage one day, who maybe will never be married or who lost their spouse, God, I pray that this uh, this mutual submission would play out in their lives and they would be able to encourage and draw other people into that way to help marriages so that we can see your kingdom come in our households and in our community. We pray this uh, knowing that you can do more than we can ask or imagine. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Thanks for being with us.